Anyway, welcome to the evening service. Um, we have communion tonight, just so you know. Uh, so be a little bit different than we normally do things. And we're going to wait upon you now for the evening offering as the usher comes forward. And we will look to him and we will pray. We'll have him pray. Jim, lead us in prayer. Sure. Dear God Almighty, uh, again, we uh, thank you for this night, Lord. And uh, please be with us, Lord. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, and help us to serve you this week. And uh, bless the word as it goes forth. And, and uh, just help us uh, in our lives, Lord. Help us to trust you in these uh, uncertain times, God. We know you're in control, and uh, now is the time to trust. And uh, please be with us. Help, to, help us to serve you and keep us well. And we thank you for all your blessings in our lives. And uh, you give us so much, Lord. And we just want to bring that back to you according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jim, you always have the greatest offering prayer, I have to say. You do a beautiful job with that prayer. <laughs> For those who are watching online and you'd like to give to keep the Center Reach Bible Church alive, you can go to our webpage, uh, cbctruth.com, CBC website, and centerreachbiblechurch.com, and you can give safely and securely. Okay, so what we're going to do, this is the first Sunday of the month, and we do communion on the first Sunday of the month. So we're going to go in our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, New Testament. And we're going to read Luke 22, verses 13 through 20. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. So Jesus is sitting with the twelve apostles. At Passover, and he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also with the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Let's have a few moments of silent prayer as we kind of just think upon uh, what has happened here. God has come to earth in the form of a man. Uh, he went to the cross for our sins and... Uh, he died and he rose again, uh, doing what we can't do for us. And he wants us to not forget that. So he asks us to do this simple thing. He asks us to remember that his body was wounded and his blood was shed. So when we eat that bread and drink that little juice, it's a reminder of what was done for us. Let's pray, Father. Let us remember this. Forgive us for our sins. And thank you for doing what you did for us that we cannot do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so now you have your little thing in front of you. This is, if you're at home, you can do this with a piece of cracker bread. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's the symbolism of what it means. We're going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians. And this little thing here has two, it's really tricky. Got a little top one is the little wafer, and then the juice is the second one. So it takes a little bit of dexterity to do that. Uh, but we're going to go to 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, and he's basically repeating what Jesus said in uh, Luke there. And uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. So at this time, we take the little thing. You can actually put your tongue on it, it comes right off. See that? It's like magic. I learned that. This is from practicing. Okay, and then we read on, verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, ate dinner, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. It's not blood, it's, it's a reminder of it. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And then we drink this here. And you get a real burst of super sugar. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we're going to get to our study tonight. And we're going to turn in our Bibles to Psalm 119, verse 1. Psalm 119, verse 1. And the word says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight. We pray that you will be with us with this study, Lord. Take it where you want it to go. Uh, that thy spirit have free reign. Take this message, Lord, as we say, Lord, Give the winds a mighty voice and take it to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond, Lord. Bring it out there, and if not there, Lord, bring it here. Bring it to each one of our hearts and let thy Holy Spirit speak to us, Lord, the things we need to hear in all the time, but especially in these troubled times. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So this is part 18, 18 weeks. We've been in Psalm uh, 119, and... It's a psalm above psalms. It's the biggest psalm, 176 verses. It's a psalm of King David. David, kind of at the end of his reign, his life, at the end of his life, and from what I've gathered, it's him looking over his diary of sorts, of his highs and his lows, his good days, his bad days, battles and victories and losses, uh, loss of, of loved ones, uh, sins that he fell into, uh, good days, bad days, betrayal, praising, everything. And he puts it all together and he basically says, all I can say is God has been good to me. Even when I'm not good to God, God is good to me. And that's just a wonderful thing. And, and the whole, uh, what's been said of 119 is that every verse is like a sermon in itself. You could do, and we've been trying to do one verse at a time. And I mean, you, there's so much in this psalm, uh, but it has a theme. It has a thread that goes through it. And from the Hebrew, uh, the title of this psalm is often called "Happy are those whose way is perfect." Okay, you know, we all want to be happy, right? Isn't that what we want? We want to be happy. Everyone wants to be happy, and God says. Happy are those whose way, the way you live, is perfect. Well, the problem is, I don't know about you guys, I can't be perfect. I've been trying, and I struggle a lot with that. And it's hard to do. And the reason is, is because we can't be perfect of our own selves. No matter how hard you try, sooner or later, you're going to lie, you're going to do something that you shouldn't do. You're going to break one of the commandments. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but God is trying to show us you can't do it, but I will do it for you. See, it is God's perfection, Christ's perfection that we trust in, not our own. See, religion says, you know, I trust in myself. If I'm really, really good, okay, then God will be really, really good to me. Well, I'll get into heaven. That's not how it works. And um, we, uh, funny thing, Saturday night we had Joyful Noise here, and uh, it's a musical group we had downstairs, and what they do is they take old, old songs from like the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and they take the old words and they put God words into it, and um, I heard them, you know, we've had them here many times, and I, and I told Charlie, who's the guy, I said, you know what, you know what song that always bothered me that you guys need to redo, and, and I, f I forgot who does it, the, the, the group, but it was that song, Oh, where, oh, where can my baby be? The Lord took her away from me. She's gone to heaven, so I got to be good so I can see my baby when I leave this world. It's really a blasphemous song, okay? It's completely alien to Scripture. And we have that thought process, oh, my girlfriend that I love, you know, because the song is about, his girlfriend gets into a car accident and he's holding her and she finally dies and he goes, I want to be with her. So he says, well, how am I going to be with her? Well, I got to be really good. 
But that's not what the Bible says. Because the problem is, is you can't be good enough. You can't. Okay? What you need to do is let God do the goodness for you and you trust in his goodness and say, God, I can't. You know what? Um, I'm a sinner. Uh, and no matter how hard I try, there's going to be always something that we, we're not going to be as perfect as God. And God says, I know. That's why I did what I did. That's why I came to this earth in the form of a man, God kept stepped out of his glory, became a man, lived on this earth. He was born 2,022 years ago. That's why we're at 2,022. That's why our calendar says that. And he lived for 33 years, and at 33 years old, and he started his ministry really at 30. He only had a three-year ministry. Uh, and at 33 years old, he went to the cross willingly. He died, he rose again. Uh, appeared to people, uh, I think he was around for 40 days, he walked the earth. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was 40 days. Uh, why? Because someone has to pay for our sins, and God says, you can't, I will do it for you. Do you believe it? Trust me. Say, God, forgive me for my sins. And God says, I will. Do you believe that I died on the cross and rose again the third day? Yes, I do. If you do, God says, well, then you're a child of mine. Trust me and make me Lord of your life. See, it's, it's really simple. Religion makes it all complicated. Uh, and you got to do this, you got to do that. You can't eat this, you can't eat that. You got to spin around three days on, you know, three times on Friday. Uh, you know, and if you do just the right things that, you know, you're going to get in the club. But that's not what the Bible says. God says, I do the good thing. You trust in my good thing. And then after we come to Christ and we become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, then well, should we try to be good? Yes. But not to be good to get to heaven because I'm already going. Be good because God says to and I'm thankful for all he's done for me. It's my reasonable service. What else can I do for God is be thankful. And that's what, you know, David here is alluding to. Happy is the person whose way is perfect. Well, once you come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, what does he want us to do? He tells us, he gives us a rule book. He tells us, when you live this life, after you come to me, okay, I've told the world what they need to do. The creator knows what's best for the creation. And he says, don't do this, do that. This will. And if you follow God's rules, okay, you're going to have a happy life. Maybe not a perfect life, but you'll have peace and you'll have happiness. And I always, uh, you know, liken this to, um, you know, if you have a car, you buy a brand new car, you know, it has a manual and they have recommendations. You've got to change your oil. Every three, I don't know what it is now, but it used to be 3,000 miles. You've got to maintain these things. And if you don't, then the car breaks down and you go to the dealer and they do. I, I know this for a fact when my father, before he passed away, he, used to, uh, he was a, a shop foreman. Uh, he actually worked at Pastor Chevrolet, a whole bunch of different dealerships. And he, and he told me about this one time when someone bought a, a newer vehicle and the engine seized, the engine blew, okay? And you know what the first thing they do is they take an oil sample. Before they're going to honor you with a new engine, you better make sure that oil was changed, you have records of it, and it was because they're looking for a little thing. You got the wrong oil in there, you're supposed to have 5W30, you got, or 5W20, you got 5W30, no good, okay? You don't get a new engine. And why do they do that? Well, they do that because they don't want to pay for it, but why do we have a system of maintenance items so our car lasts? It's a long, healthy life. You do these things, your car will take care of you, supposedly. God says, you follow the rules I have for your life, okay? Don't lie, don't cheat, be, you know, do these things, okay? And I will make sure that you have a good life, okay? A life that's honorable to God, okay? Not because we want to get to heaven, we're already going there through faith in Jesus Christ, but because... We want to please God, and God says, happy are those who follow the ways of God. And it's hard to do sometimes because, you know, most people today aren't following the ways of God. And how's that working? How's it working for the world, right? We look around, 
You know, everybody, I, it's obvious that everything that's going on in the world is because the world has dropped God's maintenance program, right? That's what happened. God says, you want to keep a nation strong, you want to keep a family strong, you, you follow these things. Don't do this, do that, okay? Well, we say, well, we're not going to follow your maintenance program. What happens, you know? It's int- I, I made up a little quote. I'm quoting this, okay? No one can steal it. Okay, when God becomes a laughing stock to us, we become a laughing stock to the world. And you look at our nation today. What has God become to our nation? Big joke. A nothing. A curse word. How many people you know say Jesus' name as a curse word all day long? Okay, God has become a joke. And what happens is we've turned from God's ways of how to have a healthy society, do not kill, do not steal, be honest, we're caught, all these things, honor God in everything we do. Well, what happens? Look at our nation, become a laughing stock. We cannot laugh at the one who has made everything and has laid out the way it's supposed to be. And tonight, we're going to, we're going to tackle in Psalm 119, we're going to tackle four verses. Uh, we're up to verse 45. So we're going to read... 45, 46, 47, and 48. And let's see what we get out of this. So this is David, King David, King of Israel, speaking of the advice he's giving us from what he's learned. And because it's in the Word of God, it is God-breathed. It is in there because God wants it in there. So he says, and if you have your own Bibles, you know, uh, don't be afraid to underline and highlight and put arrows because notice a theme here that's very important. And David is actually speaking to himself, you know, uh, reminding himself. Look at verse 45. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you the, the title before we read on. The title for tonight is The Freedom of Freedom. It okay, sounds kind of strange, a lot of people talking about freedom, but there's real freedom and there's God's freedom. And when you have God's freedom, you have everything, and you need to understand it. So we're going to talk about the word freedom, liberty, they're kind of synonymous, but you know, not all the time, but let's read again. And I will, I would underline I will. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. So David is saying, I'm making a positive, you know, determination. This is what I will do. Because we have a choice. We cannot do it or we can do it. Okay, do we agree with David? I will walk in freedom, for I seek the precepts. David is saying there, when I walk in freedom, God's freedom, Well, in order to have that freedom truly, I need to seek God's, in the word precepts here, God's ways, God's laws, follow them, God's maintenance program. Verse 46, I will, underline it again, I will. He's reminding himself and God is reminding us, I will, will you? I will speak of thy testimonies. Also before kings. Interesting. You know what? One of the biggest things that we, all of us struggle with, you know, you know, I wasn't always a Christian. I wasn't always following God. And I, you know, remember when I came to Christ, you know, in the beginning I was really excited, but, you know, I realized when I started to tell people, hey, I found Jesus, I'm going to church, I'm a Christian now. Uh, not too many people were excited about it. <laughs> but, hey, yeah, that's great. You know, they kind of thought I was kooky and I lost my mind and they lost respect for me. And uh, I remember, you know, I remember something was really important that always stuck in my mind. Uh, I, I worked for a union, and we had this function once. Uh, well, we had a lot of functions, but a lot of the big wigs and the suits and the ties come out, you know, and politicians and everything. And I remember this one business manager from another union was visiting where I was working, and we had this dinner and everything, and I remember he was going around, and he had these little wooden coins in his pocket, 
okay? And he was, he was like the guy that everybody wanted to talk to. He was the guy that day, and he was shaking hands and putting in everybody's hand like that. So I'm like, I wonder, what's he putting in everybody's hand? So I shook his hand, and he put one in my hand, and it was John 3, 6, John 3, 16 on a little coin written there. And I said, wow. You know what? Maybe, and this is an important thing. You know, sometimes, you know, how do I want to say this? Wherever you are, guys, you are peers or you have the opportunity to reach those people. And they'll listen to you if you're one of them. Because I, I always say, you know what, I can't, oh, you know, if I go to my doctor, which I go to my doctor, and I talk about Jesus, you know, we talk about God all the time. But you know what leads people to God, has the most impact, is when someone in their field that they respect is a believer. See, that guy putting that cord, he didn't care. He's the big guy, he's the cool dude, and he knows that's where he got where he can't, you know, that's where, how he got where he is. And I, it made me think of this scripture, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings, and I will not be ashamed. We think, well, if I introduce God at my work or in my life, that's going to hinder my, my future. I'm not going to get anywhere in, in the business world. God says, oh yeah, that's a lie. You assume that. Because I spoke to this guy, I said, hey, that's, I said, I'm a Christian. I said, that's really cool. I took him over. He goes, yeah, that's, I do it wherever I go. I do it wherever I go. Okay, God's brought me up here, and uh, I don't want to forget him. You know, and I, I, that always like stuck in my head forever. I was like, wow, wow. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a uh, neurologist and became good friends with him over the years. And uh, we went out, he took me out to dinner. It was really cool because he paid for everything. He took me out to a fancy restaurant out east. And uh, I was like, wow, I'm going to go out with this neurologist. I thought it was a really cool thing. And, uh, and I, you know, I felt like little next to him, but what was interesting, the discussion we had was, he was saying, you know, uh, because we, we share an interest, we got together because of counseling and psychiatry and the counseling that I do, and we became, to this very day, we're kind of partners, and I send him my patients, that, well not my patients, the people that I counsel, if people need a neurologist, he also does psychiatry. So if people do need medication, and I, you know, I, I say, you know, go to this doctor, give him, an, you know, let him give you an evaluation that he contacts me. But I remember going out with him, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to have to like really impress this guy. But he was like, you know what, I need prayer. He goes, you know what's really hard? He goes, I'm the only Christian where I work in the hospital. And, and his thing is tennis. He goes and he plays tennis, and he was like, you know what, it's so hard. Because all my colleagues think I'm a nut, you know, because I'm the Christian. And he goes, I really don't, I'm not as bold as I should, and it bothers me. And I struggle with that. Because we can go out and we can talk, you know, hospital talk and doctor talk, but when I, you know, share my faith, they think I'm not as smart as like I, you know, oh, poor thing, you've been deceived. And I remember telling him, I said, you know what? I said, you have to understand where you're at is a place that's very privileged. I said, I can't go up to your doctor friends. I can't speak to them. I mean, I could, but they're probably not going to respect me. But you have that place. You're a colleague. You're an equal with them. And if you do it right, if you say it wisely, you can have such an impact. And I, you know, I ended up encouraging him, and I was, it was the opposite that I thought it was going to be, and he was looking for comfort. You know, how do I do this? So these are important things, people. And you know, the, the, the world has brainwashed us that God is a liability in our lives. You can't bring God into your job. You can't bring God into your life. You know, you're never going to get anywhere. I remember another true story. Uh, years ago, I was doing a study, and we were 
talking, doing a study on integrity. He, what's integrity? You know what integrity is? Is doing the right thing when no one's watching. That's what integrity is. Okay? It's not stealing from work. It's not lying on your taxes. It's doing the right thing all the time, even if no one's watching. Because who is watching? God's watching. God's watching all the time. And uh, you know what? It's, it's a hard thing to do sometimes, but we need to do it. You know, I lost my train of thought. This never happened to me before. I was going somewhere with this, and I completely forgot where I was going with it. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, I know what it was. Okay, thank you, Lord. I'm very nervous. I was teaching on integrity. You guys are supposed to remind me. I said, where was I going? You were teaching on integrity. Anyway, someone from church, who's still a, a member of this church, as a matter of fact, they weren't a member at the time, but they are now, uh, came up to me, and they were a new believer, and they said, you know, Pastor, you know what, I, I, I know what you're saying about living out there, but this person owned, he owned a, you know, his own private company, a business, and he says, I have to be honest with you, if I do everything by the book, taxes, paperwork, payroll, I'll never make it. It's impossible. No one can make it and be honest. And I said, well, how do you know? How do you know? See, we just assume, well, you got to, it's the world, you got to play the world's game, right? That's the way, and that's what everybody thinks. But the few people who say, you know, if God says this is what I need to do, well, then this is what I'm going to do. And let God prove you wrong. It's just like you say, well, what's a real hard job to do as a Christian. I, I would think a car salesman, a used car salesman. I mean, there's a great movie. I think, Jeff, you remember that movie called uh, Flyleaf? We showed it once. It's, flywheel. Oh, Flywheel, that Flyleaf. Um, what am I, I'm thinking there was a band called Flyleaf. Okay, Flywheel. And it's about, it's a real cheesy movie. Uh, matter of fact, it was the guy who made like uh, all those movies, that family uh, that made uh, like uh, uh, Fireproof, all those movies. What was that guy? Remember him? Yeah, Hen Kendrick. Kendrick, yeah. It was the first movie he did, and it was about being a used car person and who was scamming everyone. You know, because people, in case you don't know it, most businesses, they're really not honest with you, okay? One of the businesses that is the easiest to deceive people. You know what it is? Auto mechanics. It's one of the easiest businesses. And there are very few. On That's why I don't go to any mechanics. I don't trust them. I'm a mechanic my whole life, but I know how easy. Because your car could come in there, okay, and you could be running all bad, and all this is a vacuum line. They plug it in, and they say, okay, we need to do a whole tune-up. They sell you all this thing. You leave with a car that's running perfect. Go, hey! But all you needed was was just to do that. So it's easy to deceive and you can make money. And what do people say? Eh, it's the way of the world. Everybody does it. You do it here, we all, you know what? We all do it. But in this movie, you know, he's scamming and scamming and scamming and, you know, selling people. He's turning back the odometers, doing the whole thing. He ends up going to church and he's, you know, his wife's a Christian and he, and, you know, what he really feels, he gets, he comes to God and he feels convicted and then he's like, his wife says, why don't you just, because the business is falling apart, their marriage is falling apart, everything's falling apart, we should really watch the movie. It's a real cheesy, you know what, it's so interesting, the movie is like really cheeseball quality, it's really bad quality, but the story is so compelling that, ha that once you get into the story, you forget how bad the movie is, because it really takes you, and he has this challenge, his wife says, hon, you say, you trust God because he falls on his knees in his living room, his business. He goes, I'm going to do this. So he decides to be an honest used car. Man. And he tells people, I wouldn't buy that car. It's got a lot of things wrong with it. Okay? And everything, but, I mean, what do you think? I mean, it's not based on a true story, but in reality, it would, people. It would. Because you know what sells his business? People start hearing, because, oh, this is what happens. 
he feels so convicted that all the people that he ripped off, he gets money and he feels, I'm going to, and he starts contacting these people. Because I have a check for you. I sold you a car, $1,000 over what it was worth. And he gives their money back. The news finds out about it. And what happens? Everyone wants to go to the used car place. They're driving from all over to buy a car from that guy. Because he found out, I can make money, more money, by just being honest. And telling like a young college student who wants the Corvette or whatever, it's not really the car for you. You're going back and forth to college. I know it's what you want. You really need to buy this dependable economy car, maybe later on in your career. And people really love that, okay? And we can laugh and say, well, that's just a movie. No, it's true because God says it. David says it. David, this is what David is saying. Happy are those whose way is perfect. Now, are there some times when you're going to get burnt and it's going to cost you? Yeah. But like that friend from church who said, Pastor, I can't do it. And, I, and when I told him, well, why don't you try, okay? Because most businesses have two sets of books. They got one for the IRS, one for themselves. They can, you know, and you have to make that determination. Is God's word what it is in everything? Because we say, now, God is good for heaven stuff, okay? Get saved, go into heaven. But I really can't use it in my daily life. He can't be really serious. No, he's serious. He's serious. One of the things, and you want to see the look on people's faces. Ever since I, and I, the Lord is my witness, ever since I became a Christian, whenever I sell a car or buy a car, and I guess what it would be, uh, well, when I would buy a used car, and people, what would they say? What do you want me to make the receipt out to? A hundred bucks? And I would say, no, I want you to make it out for what I paid for it. Are you, and, and they think you're crazy. I said, I paid 3000 for the car. Well, I make it out. You're going to have to pay taxes. I know. And it's an opportunity. I say, you know what? It's the right thing. And they say, well, who cares? I say, well, I say, well God is watching. Okay? I did this just, for, just recently with my son Luke's car that we sent down to North Carolina. Uh, one of the guys at the racetrack has a used car dealer. And I bought this car for my son. It was $3,500. And I said, so he goes, what do, you want, what do you want the receipt to be out, made out to? I said, $3,500. And he said, why? He goes, no one's going to know. You're going to be killed with taxes. I said, God knows. And that's all I care about. Now, you know when it's hard? When I'm selling a car. And the people say, and this is the, and, and I've lost, you know, over, I mean, I'm sure you guys in your life have bought and sold cars, okay? And when, now this way, it's the hard way. When I, when I tell people, listen, because they, sometimes you lose the deal, when they say, okay, you know what, make the receipt out, I say, I can't do that. I say, what do you mean? I'm paying cash. Come on. I say, I can't do it. I say, and, and they think you're like insane. And what's the out? Blame it on God. You know what? God has been good to me. And, I, and this is what I normally tell people when they think, I say, listen, God has been so good to me. You might think this is insane, I said, but he has prospered me. He has taken care of me. And how can I be dishonest with such things? They still think you're crazy. And sometimes they say, well, I'm not buying. And I've lost cars. And some people say, okay. And, and, I, and I, you know, they can make their own receipt. They do whatever they want to do. But these are the things that David learned in his life. And I think it's what he's saying. I will speak of thy testimonies also, meaning I can speak of God's truth to my friends and family, but what? how about when I'm at the UN, if they had a UN back then, and I speak into the dignitaries, when, when David was having interactions with other kings who were fighting against him, did he speak of the Lord? Okay, He goes, I will, I must, I better. And what does he say? And I will not be ashamed. Why does he say that? You know why? Because people, and look at the honesty of David. He's saying that because he knows we tend to be ashamed. We're embarrassed. Oh, I don't want them to... Think. You, know why? you know why we're embarrassed when we tell people that we've decided to follow God and Jesus Christ? Because you know why? 
we love ourselves so much, we know, we, we are more concerned about what people think about us than what they think about God. Well, how's it going to look for me? I'm going to look, well, if you love someone, can you imagine this? Can you imagine going out with, let's say, you know, you're a couple and you're dating a girl and, you know, what? and for some reason, well, this is a true story, I mean, I'm a really bad guy. Uh, I was, a, well, I still am bad, but not as bad as I was. This is a true story, true story. When I was in high school, 12th grade, Newfield High School, okay, I was a real cool dude, okay? I was a heavy metal drummer. I had the look. I was, you know, and I hung out with a lot of my cool friends. And I met this girl, her name was Lisa, and uh, she was like from like the honor society, you know, all prim and proper, little, you know, she wore the little collar. And I was embarrassed that I was going out with her. So I told her, whenever we're in the senior hallway, don't come near me, okay? I don't want my friends to see me. And she's like, okay. <laughs> I couldn't believe she did it. But when we would go out on dates, I would be like, I hope nobody sees me. She wasn't like, she was, she was a pretty girl, but she wasn't the crazy hot, cool girls that I should be dating. She was somebody that didn't match me. And I was ashamed of... Poor girl, what an idiot she was for dating me. I was such a jerk. That's a jerky thing to do. But don't we do that to God? Okay? Oh, because, you know, did you ever go to work on Monday? How was your weekend? What did you do this weekend? I went to the church on Sunday. What? Where'd you go? I went to church on Sunday. <laughs> Where were you? I said, Bible study. You know, it's like... Why are we ashamed? And yet we expect God when we pray to part the seas and to come immediately down to fix all of our problems. But when God says, do you honor me? Do you love me? Okay. Can you Again, getting back to that, imagine being in a relationship when you're uh, embarrassed of the person you love. How can you love them? Well, what are you really doing? You're caring more about what other people think about the one you're with. Do we care about what people think about the God that we love? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. And sometimes you still feel that. And you wonder, wow, why am I, why am I like that for? And God still, God says, I loved you even before you loved me. Even when you were dead in trespass and sins, God always loves us. Can you imagine somebody, and it reminds me of that girl, she still wanted to date me. I ended up breaking up with that girl because she just wasn't cool enough. That stupid thing, and I, and I was too hard of just hiding no, or my friends to see it. It's so stupid. How can you love someone like that? Yet she loved me. She loved me. She didn't care. She thought it was so cool. She was going out with this cool guy. It wasn't that cool. So anyway, let's, let's move on to verse 47. And I will, okay, delight. What does that mean? Be happy. I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. Now, this is written at the end of David's life. Now, David didn't just say these things. He did them. We know that because he says, which I have loved, past tense. What does it mean? And this is, people, I tell you, this is the, the key that really changes your walk with God. Because when you start to find pleasure in doing the right thing, you've really turned the page. Because when you do the right thing, and you know, for me to this day, and I, and I always use the example, it'll probably happen to me tomorrow, is you know, the parking lot thing. It's happened to me many times, where you go in a parking lot, and, they, and you open your door, and it puts a big dent in the person's car, and you're like, oh man. Normally you say, I'm getting out of here as quick as I can. But as a Christian, you have this thing, I know what i got to do, God. I, I feel God burning on my shoulders. Leave a note, give him your address, your phone number, tell him you put a dent in your car. And, and I always do, but you know what's funny? Of all those people, most of them say, ah, don't worry about it. Or the dent was already there. Because God always, but it's like, why is it so hard to do the right thing? We should be excited. Wow, an opportunity to be 
to do the right thing, I should be excited. David says he will delight in doing the right thing, even when it costs them. And he goes, I, didn't, I don't just want to do it. I have done it. I've loved it. Verse 48, my hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved. And I will, there it is again, meditate on thy statutes. You know, David, and I, I know we're not getting on to the freedom thing. I had all the other sermon planned. We we're going to be talking a lot more about freedom. But we got off on a tangent here. David had to remind himself. As a matter of fact, it was David who said, I will encourage myself in the Lord. Okay, David knew a little, I don't want to call it a trick, but David knew that when he was getting discouraged, when he was getting down, because remember, David was not a perfect man. He had an affair with a married woman. Then he had that woman's husband when he didn't want to get caught. He had him killed. He was king. It was a big scandal. He lost a child because of it. So David wasn't squeaky clean. But one thing David was, because we know there's a couple of people in the Bible that we see this special thing. David, God loved David. John, the apostle, the apostle that Jesus loved. John always wanted to sit next to Jesus all the time. Job, you know, God loved Job. Why did God love these people? Now, he loves all of us, but he, I, I do believe God has favorites. I do believe he does, because he says, he speaks of it, he says to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? There's none like this guy, I love this guy. But was Job a perfect guy? No, okay. Was David? David certainly, but what did God love about these people? Okay, if we get anything out of this, people, it's this, is that God loves those who love him. Okay, David just loved God. He didn't play any, God, I did this for you, now you owe me. No, he just loved God. And when he sinned, what did David say? Those, those famous words, against thee and thee only have I sinned. It killed him. When, when he sinned, you know, they, his servants found him, you know, not eating on the floor. He's like, David, what's wrong? He was so distraught when he did something wrong. Not because he got caught, because he sinned against God. It bothered him. And God loved, because he knew David's love for God was real. Because, you know, we always think, well, you've got to be perfect. David wasn't perfect. David was a mess. Solomon was a real mess, his son. But what did God look for? Those who really love him simply because of who God is. David, as a little boy, looking up, as he's watching the sheep, looking up at the stars, pondering. He just loved God. He loved God. And you're, you, you're only hurt when you hurt someone if you really love them. Right? If you hurt someone that you really don't care about, you don't care. But if you really love someone and you hurt them, it bothers you. David understood this. David knew the freedom of trusting and walking in God. What's the freedom of walking in, in God's way? It's knowing that I am free from condemnation. I am free from the judgments of this world. Okay, and I, I, I know I've been quoting a lot, Isaiah 54, 17. Uh, my, my mind's going blank today. I didn't have enough caffeine. Uh, uh, oh, gosh. Isaiah 54, 17. Ah, there you go. Thank you. I'm really slacking tonight. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. Isaiah 54, 17. Have it in my, in my office. And, you know, David knew that. And he knew that, you know what's freedom? That person might hate me. That person might speak lies against me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anybody says about me because I know where I stand with God. My righteousness is between me and Him. No one else can judge me except God. 
It's a powerful scripture, and you need to remember that as we face enemies, as we face people at work who throw us under the bus. If, if you've been in the working community, you know, in the, even in school, wherever, with our friend groups, okay, you'll find out that there'll be people, you know, I, I wish I can say this will never happen to you, but you'll probably meet a friend that you really trust, and then you find out, you know, they were talking about you to another friend, and you find out about it, and it's like, wow, that really hurt. They threw me under the bus. I can't believe you said that about me. And it'll destroy you. But God says, I give you freedom. Liberty. I give you freedom from what anybody thinks of you. Because it only matters what I think of you. I give you freedom from the judgment of your sins because your sins have been paid for by my son. You're free from that. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I've been debating lately, I know, it's because it's a, a big topic, people who are looking at the world and going, well, the, you know, rapture, you know, the church is going to be in the middle of the rapture, we're going to go through, and I keep arguing with people. I said, and I've told people, if God is going to judge his bride that he loves so much, okay, you might as well take the whole Bible and throw it out. If the church goes through the tribulation, the whole character of God is completely skewed. Everything he says is a lie. And I flip out on people because I'm so tired of hearing it. And I tell them, if we are the bride of Christ and God, if you are a bridegroom and you have the power to keep your bride from a bad situation, won't you do it? Doesn't Jesus have the ability? And the scripture is, the judgment that's coming on the world is not for his bride. Where did our or well, when did our judgment fall? It fell on Jesus Christ at the cross. That's where that scripture comes from. There was no condemnation for those who were in Christ Jesus. We got no punishment coming. Our punishment that we deserve for whatever we've done went to Jesus. That's the great thing about the gospel. God pays for what I did wrong. You know what that would be like? Okay? We got some young people here. I know we got the De Bartolo boys over there. I'm going to embarrass you guys. Okay, imagine if one of your siblings there, okay, does something wrong, okay, and something bad in, in the house, and your other brother comes up to you and says, Jake, whatever, uh, you know what, I know you did that, I am going to take the heat for it. I'll tell mom and dad that I did it. <laughs> they go, no, they ain't going to do it. <laughs> I'll do that so because you've had a bad day. I feel so bad for you. And I know you didn't mean it. Let them be mad at me. Isn't that a strange thing to do? That's what God did. You did this, but I am going to take the blame for it. That's love. That's, that's you know, uh, Brother John Howell this morning spoke about our uh, kinsman redeemer. Okay, Jesus Christ. Uh, you know what? He paid for what we did so we don't have to pay for it. No greater love. No greater love as a man has that he lays down his life for his friend. When the friend really deserves it. And that's the interesting part. Okay? It's, it's one thing standing up for someone when they, you know, when they were innocently accused. But what happens when they really did something wrong and you stand up for them, and you take the punishment for them. That's what God did for us. Why would he do such a thing? Because he loves us. He goes, I don't want you to feel that pain. Let me take it for you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that an amazing story? That's freedom, people. Because now I can live this life going, yeah, I'm going to screw up. And Trust me, I don't want you to have this thought, that, okay, well, I can do whatever I want now. I'm, I'm free from any... No, because God, once He becomes your Father, okay, because remember, to the world right now, God is just a creator. But when you come to Christ, He becomes your Father, and you become His child. And what's a good dad going to do? If you do something wrong, He's going to give you a little punishment. Okay? When you do something right, you know what He's going to do? He's going to give you a big hug, take you out for ice cream. Okay. Isn't that great? But he's always going to do everything for your best interest. 
Okay? Well, actually, for his best interest, which is that you're going to be okay. And I pray we understand that. And you know what? That's where we're going to end with tonight. I can't believe I did all that yapping. I didn't even, I got pages and pages here. Ah, wasn't meant to be. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads in the word of prayer tonight. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, I thank you, Lord, uh, that you did something so amazing, Lord, and it's given us freedom. Freedom beyond anything we can imagine. And, and I know to the world, they don't understand. Well, I, I don't see freedom, but they don't understand. I do have freedom. I have freedom from reproach. I have freedom from condemnation. I have freedom from penalties for my sin. I have freedom from what's coming on this world. I have freedom from that. And that is true freedom. And where there is liberty, there is freedom. And where there is freedom, there's liberty. And we can't get to that true freedom unless we follow truth. Because truth is the only way to freedom. And there is no greater freedom than Christ gives. The freedom at the cross. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's stand. We'll close with a song.